The Book of Disquiet by Fernando Pessoa Section 139 For a long time, I haven't written. Months have gone by in which I haven't lived, just endured, between the office and physiology, in an inward stagnation of thinking and feeling. Unfortunately, this isn't even restful since in rotting there's fermentation. For a long time now I haven't written, and I haven't even existed. I hardly even seem to be dreaming. The streets for me are just streets. I do my office work conscious only of it, though I can't say without distraction. In the back of my mind I'm sleeping instead of meditating, which is what I usually do. But I still have a different existence behind my work. For a long time now, I haven't existed. I'm utterly calm. No one distinguishes me from who I am. I just felt myself breathe as if I'd done something new or done it late. I'm beginning to be conscious of being conscious. Perhaps tomorrow I'll wake up to myself and resume the course of my own existence. I don't know if that will make me more happy or less. I don't know anything. I lift my pedestrian's head and see that on the hill of the castle, the sunset's reflection is burning in dozens of windows in a lofty brilliance of cold fire. Around these hard flamed eyes, the entire hillside has the softness of day's end. I'm able to at least feel sad, and to be conscious that my sadness was just now crossed. I saw it with my ears, by the sudden sound of a passing tram, by the casual voices of young people, and by the forgotten murmur of the living city. For a long time now, I haven't been I. Section 140 it sometimes happens more or less suddenly that in the midst of my sensations I'm overwhelmed by such a terrible weariness of life that I can't even conceive of any act that might relieve it. Suicide seems a dubious remedy and natural death, even assuming it brings unconsciousness, an insufficient one. Rather than the cessation of my existence, which may or may not be possible, this Weariness makes me long for something far more horrifying and profound, never to have existed at all, which is definitely impossible. Now and then I seem to discern, in the generally confused speculations of the Indians, something of this longing that's even more negative than nothingness. But either they lack the keenness of sensation to communicate what they think, or they lack the acuity of thought to really feel what they feel. The fact is that what I discern in them, I don't clearly see. The fact is that I think I'm the first to express in words the sinister absurdity of this incurable sensation. And yet, I do cure it by writing about it. Yes, for every truly profound desolation, one that's not pure feeling but has some intelligence mixed in with it, there's always the ironic remedy of expressing it. If literature has no other usefulness, it at least has this one, though it serves only a few. The ailments of our intelligence unfortunately hurt less than those of our feelings, and those of our feelings, unfortunately, less than those of the body. I say unfortunately because human dignity would require it to be the other way around. There is no mental anguish vis-a-vis -vis the unknown that can hurt us like love or jealousy or nostalgia, that can overwhelm us like intense physical fear, or that can transform us like anger or ambition. But neither can any pain that ravishes the soul be as genuinely painful as a toothache, a stomachache, or the pain I imagine of childbirth. 
were made in such a way that the same intelligence that ennobles certain emotions or sensations, elevating them above others, also humbles them, when it extends its analysis to a comparison among them all. I write as if sleeping, and my entire life is an unsigned receipt. Inside the coop where he'll stay until he's killed, the rooster sings anthems to liberty because he was given two roosts.